in the secular world, I feel like if pretty much every artist wrote a song about the exact same thing, people would get pretty over it. But it's cool that we can just sing about the fact that Jesus bore our sins and took our place and gave us his amazing grace. That rhymed and I didn't even plan it. Um, yeah, I, it never gets old. You do pick that song like every week. It never gets old. <laughs> pick this song every week to be good. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's pray. Father, we just love you so much. And we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, beautiful day you've given us. And Lord, for this assembly that you brought together this morning. As we praise your name, as we lift you up today in our hearts, Lord, be glorified here in the midst of your people. And Father, we ask you would bless this offering that, we're, that has been given. Lord, would you use your glory and your honor for your people. Bless us, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Sunday. 
Uh, welcome to anybody online. Thank you for joining us uh, remotely. And any visitors that are here today, we're glad you're with us. We hope I've met a few of you, but hey, we just hope here at Emmanuel that you experience Christ, enjoy the worship. Uh, you know, when you hear the word of God here in a few minutes, we hope that impacts your heart and uh, you can find a home here. Thank you, everybody who helped at the meeting or that attended the meeting after church last Sunday. I didn't make it personally, not into meetings, but um, no, I'm just kidding. But um, thank you, everybody, for being here. We did take some surveys, so those are still being uh, filtered through, and uh, we're going to be doing some follow-up on those. So thank you for filling those out as we consider uh, the growth of the church here. We will have communion at the end of the service, so please just prepare your hearts for that. We want to take that with a, a clear, clean conscience and remember the sacrifice of Jesus uh, that he gave for us. So that will be right after Pastor Mark's message today. And uh, Saturday is the block party, so it's coming up super fast. Things fly. I remember when we started planning this. When you plan big things like this, you always think, oh, that's like four months away. We don't need to work on it. And now... It's like five days away, and it's going to be a stressful week, but we got this. Um, we could use some help. That You do have a bulletin in, sir. That is your ticket to get in, so you better bring it. Um, give it away. Or give it away. Um, we do need some help. Uh, probably, I'm not going to take a poll or anything right now, but for setup on Saturday morning, we usually come in at like 10 or so and just put a couple hours in, and then the party starts at 4, so we usually have time to go home. It really doesn't take long. It's pretty much tables, chairs, some games, bounce house that many hands make light work. So if you are able on Saturday morning, I will take your help. We will take your help. Um, outside of that, uh, we have the men's conference coming up over Labor Day weekend. Please see Pastor Mark or Ken if you want to sign up. I will be collecting money. So please, it is $100 per person. But if you uh, if times are tough, if things are tight, we do have some scholarships available. So just talk to myself, Ken, Pastor Mark, and we'll make sure you're there. We don't want you to miss it. All right, I think that's all I have. Is that $100? I'll be taking that. <laughs> I'm putting it in an envelope somewhere. Yeah, this needs to get cut out of the live feed. <laughs> David and Elsie, or maybe just David, would you come up? We have a mission report. Sending the kids down before this? No way. All right. Good for mission stuff. All right, good. Do we have our presentation? All right. Well, we have a new ministry that has just started up. Pastor Joel has been asked to be the chaplain at Independence Village. So let's be... So that's... Every Sunday morning, so that's why he's not here. He wants to be here, but he can't be two places. So um, uh, we just uh, want to be in prayer for him, for the people at Independence Village, and uh, just uh, be encouraged that God is using many people uh, to get the word out, to get his word out. So we, we praise him for that. Let's go to the next slide. This is Rick Mar Marilyn Perhai, uh, our missionaries to Ukraine. They're in the U.S. right now, and obviously they have uh, important things to, uh, to cover. They uh, have their first, well, I'm not sure if they're first, but their fourth grandchild. <laughs> Time goes fast. Her name is Sila. And we know in the Bible, Selah is used quite often, especially in the Psalms. Selah acts as a prompt beaconing us to stop and consider the emphasis God places on his promises and truth. Very uh, excited about that. Uh, we're not sure when they're going back to Ukraine, but uh, as far as we know, uh, they are going back uh, relatively soon. So be praying for them. Let's go on. August 13th, dueling pianos for the Pregnancy Care Center. Um, $30 for adults, and $5 for children under 13. I don't know if you are under 16. If you have a 15-year-old, they can probably eat $30 worth of food. So <laughs> it's probably a great deal. It's a, it's a great fundraiser for them. So um, 
if you can make it, that would be great. And let's go to our next slide. Our mission celebration. We have a date, October 1st. We're excited. There's going to be more uh, details to come. But when we think about missions, what is the church's mission statement? You know, we think about businesses, and they all have their vision statement, mission statement. What is the church's mission statement? I was thinking about this a little bit, and I came up with this. I'm not sure that, uh, well, I think it's appropriate. Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a, mul a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Isn't that our mission statement to see the multitudes from every tribe and nation so let's pray for our missionaries that are um, out in the fields. Let's pray for our pastors here who are doing the mission work for the church here today uh, for Emmanuel. Let's pray for those who are taking the gospel to our community here. There's so much work to be done and so many people who don't know Christ. But we know our mission will be fulfilled, that one day there will be multitudes standing before our Lord and our God. So let's pray for them right now. Heavenly Father, how we come before you thanking you that we can be part of the mission that you've brought us, the mission of taking your gospel to the world. Lord, help us to be faithful to that task. Give us wisdom. Give us strength, give us encouragement as we follow your calling to bring Christ to the nations, to bring your word to the nations, Lord. We pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. Thank you, David. And uh, yeah, very good. Our mission of the church is to go out to seek and save the lost, and that's uh, so wonderful. Uh, I do want to send our little ones down to nursery. We want to keep them up just for a moment. And they're all part of the church. And some of even our little ones are giving financially. They're serving. They're, they're uh, involved in the ministry here, which is so awesome to see. We're going to send our little ones down, five and under, for nursery. And uh, the rest of you, if you'll open, uh, get your Bibles out, and we're going to be looking at a few different passages here this morning. So uh, let's pray, and we're going to get into the Word this morning. All right, uh, Father, we just uh, thank you so much for being able to be uh, here in this place uh, with brothers and sisters, uh, friends and family, and being able to gather as your people, uh, the, this uh, flock uh, of sheep of, uh, of your pastor. We just pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us, uh, help us to uh, be willing, Lord, to hear from you and to follow uh, you as our good shepherd. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Who knows the last verse of the book of Judges? Last verse of the book of Judges. Yes. Yes, yeah, very good. So, yeah, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, right? And uh, dark days of Israel, the time of the Judges, it's all summed up in really that last verse, everyone doing what they felt was right in their own eyes. It's uh, very similar to today, isn't it? And we see that today could be described in a very similar manner, that everyone is doing what's right in their own eyes. And in that time, the devil was going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The enemies of God's people were gaining victory upon victory, and the people of God had given up and just were trying to hold down the fort. And they did not expect then uh, for God to do the miracles and to save the multitudes in the ways that he had used to. I want to share with you this morning 
that when you're expecting, everything changes. So we're going to look at a godly expectation that gives us confidence. Now, who in this room is expecting? Literally, a baby. Expecting? <laughs> okay, there's several that are hands are up here. Isn't that amazing? And uh, how many have had a baby? You know, things change when you're expecting a baby, don't they? And then when the baby comes, it's more changes that come. And it's an exciting time, but that's that anticipation of things to come. Now, how many say that you're expecting that God is still able to do miracles and move in your life and in the lives of others? And so that's the expectation that we're going to talk about. Not so much the baby expectation, but we could, we could this morning. But looking at uh, our expectation of God to move and to work into our lives. But sometimes we can reach an age or come to a place where we feel that maybe God has forgotten us. Or maybe those times are in the past. And we can say then that uh, this morning and every morning that God is still God. And if you're at a place where you think those were times past, I had great expectations for what God could do in and through me and, and the ministry that he might have called me to, but maybe that's in the past. That's not, that does not have to be that way because God is still moving and active and wants to use us today. Amen? Amen. And so I want to encourage all of us here, especially if you're older and you've gotten to a place where you think these things were for them, but not for now. In uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verse uh, 15 and 16, it says, As the people were in, what's our word? Expectation, right? And we're all questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered and s them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In the Williams translation, the very first verse says, well, as the people were in expectation, but it, it reads this way. Now while the people were on tiptoe in their expectations. Now if you're on tiptoe, the, vi the, vision, the visual there is really... Standing on your tiptoes with expectation, like you might be standing at a parade, just waiting to see the different things come by. And so God's people were, as this, as this translation said, on their tiptoes with expectation, hoping that maybe their prayers had been answered. And they had, not in the way that they had thought at that moment, but they had been answered, hadn't they? And that the Messiah was coming, and John would be the forerunner of the Messiah. Do you come to church with expectation that God is going to do something? Or do you just come thinking, I'm just going to leave the same way that I came? And when we can say, we're coming, we're singing, we're going to worship, we're going to give, we're going to pray, come to the altars when there's an opportunity, or even if there's not one given, there's an expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to move in the hearts of the people here today. And that's true for our families, our marriages, our church, that God is still active and going to do something. And I say, well, pastor, everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. But this is, that's for the world. But what about, the, what about us as the people of God? How are we going to respond to that? Or we might ask, well, what are you waiting for? I have a little clip here. Last week, I mentioned a movie, Tangled. Uh, so this week, I'm going to mention another movie, The Incredibles. Who's seen that movie? Okay, more of you have than that. I know you. Okay, we're going to show a little bit of clip. It's not in context, so if it doesn't make sense to you, I'm not going to explain it all. But if you've seen it, then it'll make more sense. So go, go ahead, Kim, we'll okay, show that. Well, what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing. So what are you waiting for? Say, I don't know, something amazing, I guess. A little kid out in his tricycle all day waiting for something to happen that would come. In the Psalms, it says, it is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. And say, these are, are troubled times, but that's the time for the Lord to act. Or there's trouble in my relationships or my family or my finances or whatever it might be, this is the time for the Lord to act. You might say, 
There's trouble in our culture. It's woke, right? And we see these are dark days. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, our belief in God, our belief in God will give us a passion then. That we do not have to uh, be living in fear. It really depends on what you believe. And I might submit to you that there's never been a greater day to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ than today. And that God wants you to be a part of it. So no more groaning about being in the last days, right? I'm not saying you're doing that, but if you are, then this is the time really for the word of God to go forth. And in the judges, it was a period of dark days. And I want to share with you about a particular judge named Gideon. And we have a, we have a, we have a Gideon is right down there. <laughs> okay. All right. He's here. All right. So turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. And we're going to look at Gideon, one of the judges. I'll start in verse 11. Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abiz, right? While his son Gideon was beating out the wine, the wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Remember Gideon in the beating out the wheat in the wine press? The wheat was to be beaten actually out in the, on the hilltop so the wind would, would take the chaff away and the seed would fall to the ground. But he's in the wine press. He's afraid. And so he's hiding. And the angel of the Lord appears and says, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And how many know that? And he said, well, was Gideon a mighty man of valor? Well, not really at the moment. But God doesn't see us always for who we are, but what we can be through him. And this is what he's calling him to. But look at Gideon's response, verse 13. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the, his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Saying, well, God, you used to move, but why aren't you doing that now? You used to do miracles and bring restoration and healing and different things, but it's not, I'm not seeing it now. He says, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But the Lord has forsaken us and given us to the hand of the Midian, Midianites. He's blaming God for things. And Gideon is really waiting for God to move, but God is actually waiting for Gideon to step out in faith. And he's about to call him to something. And we see um, then that Gideon tells Gideon that he has a job for him to do. Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. What he's saying here really is that uh, of all the tribes, I'm the least. Of all the families of the tribes, mine is the poorest. And even within my own family, I'm the runt of the litter. And he's insulting God by saying that, How can you use me? I'm just an ordinary person. But for you who are here today, if you're a man, woman, a boy, or a girl, then that God can use you, and you can be God's person. Verse 16, the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Jump down to verse 34. How would all this happen? The Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpets, and the Abizrites were called out. Follow him. And so how does it happen? Through the spirit of the Lord. It's not the man. It's not the boy or the girl or the woman. It's, it's not the person. It's God in the man. And being God with us is what makes the difference. Gideon is a fearful farmer, but God has called him to be a man of valor. And he's calling him out for what he is. And I think of what he can be through, through God. First Corinthians touches on this, where it says, For consider your calling, brothers, not many were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. John Wesley put it this way. He said, If I had 300 men who feared nothing but God, hated nothing but sin, 
and were determined to know nothing among men except Jesus Christ and him crucified, I would set the world on fire. Now, is that your heart's cry today, that you would fear nothing but God, hate nothing but sin, and determined to know nothing about men except Jesus Christ and him crucified? You will be a powerful instrument in God's hand if that is the case. Gideon, you may say, well, you don't know my background or what I've done. But look at how God is using Gideon, calling him to this. Jump over to chapter 7. We're going to read a few more verses here. Chapter 7, verse 12. And the Midianites and the Malachites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. So this is a, a formidable foe. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no, no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given him into his hand Midian and all the camp. So just... Watch this here. Basically, God's telling him, told Gideon ahead of time, you're to go to the camp of, of the Midianites and uh, for a lesson that I'm going to teach you. Gideon gets another man to go with him into the camp, see what's going on. Kind of a reconnaissance, scouting, spying uh, mission. Gideon slips past the guards. He gets right into the middle of the Midianite camp, and he hears two men talking. So he's eavesdropping on this conversation. One man shared, I had a terrible dream last night. The other says, well, what was it? It was a loaf of barley bread that rolled down the hill. It hit the tent. When it did, it knocked the whole tent down. Just a roll of barley bread. Now, who's afraid of a loaf of barley bread? <laughs> it, it tumbled. And that literally means it turned itself over. And it turned over the Midianite camp. The other man says, well, you know what, who that was. And that roll of barley bread, that's Gideon. Gideon heard that. The men, the men said, we've, we've lost. And you think about barley bread, you may not know this, but this was the poorest bread that you could get. It's not like whole grain wheat. Barley bread is poor man's bread. And it comes tumbling down, and it destroys the whole thing. And look at Gideon's response in verse 15. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped. That's the first thing that he did is he's worshiping the Lord. And he returned to the camp of Israel and he said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he, said, he comes back and says, Fellas, we've already won this. It's already over. Why? Because God has given it. You might say, Well, Gideon, you're just a loaf of barley bread. What can you do? Well, when you're tumbling down a hill and it hits the camp and God does its work, a lot, right? It can make a difference. And I want to share with you that there's a dread of hell over a Christian who knows who he is in Christ. And you might just say, well, I'm just a loaf, a roll of barley bread. Well, that's right. And some people think that maybe they're too big for God to use. But if you understand that that's all that you are, but God takes ordinary people and with a clean heart and being filled with the Holy Spirit can do incredible things. For God. And we should then expect that God is going to use us. And the last thing that, that Satan wants is for God's people to wake up and to know who we are in Christ. Gideon, just a barley bread, but he's dangerous to the, the Midianite camp. Go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter 19. I have a few verses in the New Testament for you. Acts chapter 19, verse 11, sons of Sceva, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to 
to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had the evil spirit, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus, watch this, whom Paul proclaims. This is secondhand religion, isn't it? It's not their, it's not their faith, saying, I adjure you by the, by the Jesus, that not that I can proclaim, but by Paul proclaims. They're living out their faith through someone else. And look at the difference here. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And it's, you laugh. It's a little bit comical, isn't it? I know, we know the demons know Jesus, and they know Paul, because Paul is a servant and follower of Jesus Christ, but they don't know this other person. I want you to consider this. Does hell know your name? And you might say, well, I hope not. But the truth is that you want hell to know your name. Because why? You're dangerous to them. If you don't know, if they don't know you, because then it's, the reason is you don't have Jesus Christ. They don't recognize you then. But they will recognize you when you have Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't want that. Yes, you do. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we, have, we can go in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ then. That, he's what gives us authority. You're in, a da- you're in a more dangerous situation when they don't know who you are. And look what happened to the sons of Sceva. It was pretty humiliating if you consider it here. Uh, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. All right, that's not what we want happening, right? Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And when you make a stand for Jesus Christ, you will be on the radar of hell. The devil will know your name. When you love Jesus, you'll be a target of hell. The devil is attacking our churches, our marriages, and, his, and our families, seeking whom he may devour. Take, take a look at 1 Peter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You might say, well, there's going to be an attack. Well, yes, there will. But after you suffer for a little while, the God of all grace then will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's a lot of adjectives, isn't it? Say, I need to be restored, I need to be confirmed, I need to be strengthened, I need to be established. And how's that going to happen? It's by resisting the devil then, and saying, I'm going to make a stand for Jesus Christ. Last verses here. Flip over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Verse 46, this is uh, just before Jesus' triumphal entry. He's coming into Jerusalem. He's about to be crucified. They came to Jericho just outside Jerusalem. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. When he had heard that it was Jesus uh, Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then he rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And so he was silent and said nothing more. That's not how it goes, is it? He cried out all the more, right? And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to share with you just a few things here before we go on and and wrap things up here. There's a blind beggar here, Bartimaeus, but he's not the only one. It's actually a, a street lined with beggars. And he's crying out, Jesus. He cannot see him, but he knows that he's there. And he says, son of David. And that's a very loaded term. And what he's saying is that you're the one that we've been looking for. You're the one who's been prophesied. You're the one who's going who's gonna to be the king of kings. He's going to set up an eternal kingdom that will, that will be everlasting. And you're the one who can restore my sight and do everything else than that the Messiah, the son of David, has come to do. And he gives voice to his faith. And, he's, and it's a bold move. 
for him to do that, to cry out in a crowd like that. It takes some courage, doesn't it? And he's a blind man, but he actually is the only one here who's really seeing Jesus by faith. Son of David, very significant demonstration of his faith. And we see then the crowd tries to tune him out. And they don't want to rebuke him. And he cries out even all the more. He's not deterred when others will try to um, criticize or challenge him to seek out Jesus Christ. In your life, if you're going to live for Jesus Christ, there's going to be those that are going to challenge that and that will question you and tell you to, this is not the right place or the time for that. And you have to be willing to make a stand for Jesus Christ. And he tunes out the crowd and he cries out even more. And then look at this in verse 50. Well, verse 49. Jesus stopped and he said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. Verse 50. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. This is very significant. The cloak was government issued. If you wanted to beg in that day, you had to, get, you had to make an appeal to the government. And if you were deemed a credible beggar, you would be certified as disabled and you were given a coat. And that way you could sit by the roadside with your coat and everyone would know that you're an official beggar. And that you're not being hustled. But what he does is he throws his coat away. He's saying, that's not my identity anymore. I don't need that coat anymore. That, and he does this before the miracle. He's expecting that Jesus is going to heal him. And he's saying, that old life, I'm leaving that behind. I don't need that anymore, and I'm following Jesus. This is a very significant move for him to do. In verse 51, Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. It's a very important question. What do you want me to do for you? Or what do you expect that I'm able to do for you? And he could have said, I just need some spare change. Right? What a disappointment that would have been. He said, well, what's your expectation? And really, he's saying, God, I want you to change my life. That I know that I can, spare change is one thing, but God changing your life that's another thing. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight, and he followed him on the way. His eyes were open. He could have gone anywhere, done anything. Freedom. He can go do what he wants. He doesn't have to beg by the roadside anymore. Of all the things he could do at that moment, he chooses to follow Jesus. And that's really what sums up to be a Christian. It says your faith has made you well. Not just his eyesight, but his heart. New, new life following Jesus Christ. That's always the story. We sang this morning, Amazing Grace, right? Or at least the, was it Chris Tomlin, rendi new rendition of it? Uh, this is Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. And he threw off all the excuses and whatever the crowd had to say, and he gives, he, he submits his life to Jesus Christ. And God will give you amazing grace in doing that. I want to invite if our worship team can come on up here at this time. And we just have a few minutes left, but I want to share with we have we have young people, we have older people. You know who you are. People all in between. And you may say you're just a loaf of barley. But if, if you're known in hell because you serve Jesus Christ and you have him, then you can knock the tent of the enemy down. And how? It's not through you. It's really through God in you. And don't say you're too ordinary or that you're too young or that you're too old. And you might say, well, those were things of the past. That's what Gideon said. I heard the stories of how you delivered us from Egypt, but what are you doing today? And God was really waiting on Gideon. And maybe he's waiting on you. Maybe there's something that he's calling you to do. And we can then say, well, what is it? How would you have me to serve? Say, what would you like me to do? How can I live my life for you? As a church, we have to ask the same question. We're surrendered to you. How do we bring glory and honor to your name? How do we go out and reach the lost? What is it that God is calling us to do?
you might say, well, uh, maybe, I, maybe I need my life changed in a way by Jesus Christ. I don't need, cha- I don't need change, money. I need Jesus. And he's really the one who's going to make the difference. And if you don't find it in Jesus, you'll try to get that cup filled up by other people. And that's what happens. And we say, Jesus, you're, the, you're enough for everything that's needed. We're going to pray, and then we'll share in communion together. And communion is a wonderful opportunity for us to testify of the change that Jesus has made in our lives. You get up and you walk forward, then we receive the elements. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can come and receive the elements, the bread, which is a symbol of his broken body, and the cup, which is a symbol of his shed blood for our sins. As we take that, we're testifying that Jesus has changed us. We're not who we used to be. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed. The new has come. We have new life. We're born again. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That means that we have our sins are forgiven. We're washed clean. And then we can take communion freely. You may say, well, I'm, I haven't done that yet. I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And you can do that even right now. The truth is that we are sinners by birth, by nature, by choice, by our own practice. Sin deserves God's judgment. We also know that God will save anyone who will trust him. The Bible says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What do you believe about Jesus? That he died for your sins? That he shed his blood for you? He loves you. He's raised from the dead, and he's willing and able to save you, and he will. And we have to pray to receive him, that we would receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do then, that we have our sins are cleansed, are forgiven, we're not ashamed of Jesus Christ, we know that he is everything that we Father, I just I pray for our church family here today, just with uh, every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, you know what's going on in each life here today. For the believer, you know the expectations that we have for of what you are able to do in our lives. And we know that you are asking us, what do you want me to do for you? And so, Lord, as we share in this time of communion together, help build our strength in our faith, Lord, that we would have greater expectation of what you are able to do, what you are willing to do in our lives. Forgive us for doubting you or for even blaming you for not coming through in the way that maybe we thought that you should. But we know, Lord, that you are able to take an ordinary person Lord, and do extraordinary things. And so help strengthen our faith in these things. And I do pray that, that no one would leave this place without surrendering their life to Jesus Christ. And we know that you will in no wise cast out anyone who comes to you in faith. Lord, no matter what we've done or whatever our past may be, Lord, you have a way of erasing all of that through the blood of Christ, making us a new creation. Let us take communion with joy in our hearts, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you will do, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 I can have Pat, if you come and assist over here. Brad, if you can come forward. Robert. Communion is a time that we remember Jesus. In fact, we're going to take it in remembrance of him. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, that you may come forward. We'll have Brad and Pat over on that side. Robert and I will be on this side. When you're ready, you may come down the center aisle. Come over here, receive the elements, and back to your seat. And then we'll take communion together when you're ready. So you may come forward.
What's on your mind? The secrets of heaven I live to search and to find. So hide me deep inside your heart, Lord. Cover me with your wings. Bring me into safety. Bring me into fellowship. And lift up the bread. And Father, we thank you for your broken body. Lord, we know that has brought us life. We're thankful, Lord, that you love us so much, Lord, that even while we were yet sinners, that you died for us. Help us to receive this in remembrance of you in the new life that we have, Lord, because of what you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take and eat. You lift the cup. And Father, as we take the cup of grape juice, we know it's a symbol of your shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us to not take this lightly, but to remember the great cost, Lord, that brought us salvation. And Lord, let us testify of your amazing grace, Lord, in, your li- in our lives, and proclaim holy, 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 Lord, for what you have done, setting us apart. Lord, through the blood of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name, you may take and drink. Please stand and join us for our closing song.
I want to give a few uh, recognitions here before we go today. Uh, Pastor Bob and Sonia, who do you have with you? Birthdays. I don't normally do this, but Pastor Paz was yesterday, and next is tomorrow. Someone's up, God But uh, God bless you. We love you all. Have a wonderful week. Keep singing in the name of Jesus as you go each and every day. We'll see you back next week or Saturday. Black party.